Amid the shadows of war-torn London, where the echoes of air raid sirens mingled with the whispers of high society, Pamela Churchill emerged as an enigmatic figure whose allure and ambition knew no bounds. Dubbed the greatest courtesan of the 20th century by Bill Paley and that bitch by many, Pamela's life was a canvas of scandalous affairs and forbidden romances. Yet, behind the veneer of her dazzling social escapades lay the story of a woman sculpted by the old aristocracies of England, a woman who ascended to the pulsating heart of global conflict, becoming an important advisor to Winston Churchill and later the American ambassador to France. She navigated the intricate dance of diplomacy and desire with the shrewdness of a chess master. Her romantic liaisons with barons, politicians, and millionaires scandalized society, but few knew the role she played behind the scenes as an advisor to politicians and governments. Join us this week for our look at the notorious Pamela Churchill. Pamela was born into one of England's oldest families and raised in the Dorset countryside. Her father, the 11th Baron Digby, was a veteran of the Great War and a recipient of the French Croix de Guerre. As the eldest child, traditional rules of inheritance meant her younger brother would receive everything. Upper-class British women at the time were groomed more for roles as wives and mothers than for educational pursuits. Socially vibrant but unhappy with rural life, Pamela longed for the city. Her looks didn't conform to conventional beauty standards, leading to a disappointing debut. Her peers often ridiculed her plain attire and appearance. Among her few friends was Kathleen Kennedy, daughter of the American ambassador, through whom she met Lady Olive Bailey, an American heiress who hosted weekly parties at Leeds Castle. At these gatherings, Pamela mingled with high society and began affairs with older married men, finding young men her age unappealing. Older men were appreciative, engaging, and financially generous, qualities Pamela valued and was happy to receive gifts and money for. With the onset of World War II, the weekend parties ceased and Pamela briefly worked as a French translator. Her relationship with Winston Churchill's son, Randolph, was far from a romantic tale. Randolph was in London seeking entertainment and a mutual acquaintance provided Pamela's number, describing her as a fun, red-headed tart. Intrigued by his notoriety, Pamela quickly engaged. Upon his inquiry about her appearance, she replied, red-headed and rather fat, adding, but mummy says puppy fat disappears. He proposed to her on their first date. He was terrified of dying in the war and wanted to be sure he left a male heir. Love was not an issue for Pamela. It was her way of escaping the dull English country life she feared. They were married that October in 1939. Britain had been at war with Germany for barely two months. Although they had a son, Winston, named after his grandfather, the marriage only lasted five years. Randolph was a philandering alcoholic who accumulated enormous gambling debts, which he asked his young wife to honor. The marriage was clearly in trouble, and she began to realize the importance of money. Isolated in a small London apartment, she became a close confidant of both Lord Beaverbrook and her father-in-law, Winston Churchill. Both had noticed the fragility of her marriage, but had also noted that the young bride had unusual qualities that could be useful to them. She learned quickly how to use her powerful allies. Introduced by the flamboyant socialite Lady Cunard at a Dorchester dinner to Averill Harriman, Franklin Roosevelt's Lend-Lease expediter, she found herself instantly attracted to the handsome and rich American. 30 years her senior, Harriman was the heir to the Union Pacific Railroad fortune. Leaving his wife behind, he had arrived in London in March 1941, and they began an instant affair. She knew everybody who was anybody in London and was able to introduce Harriman to this new English world. She also kept Churchill and Beaverbrook informed as to Harriman's thoughts on America's vital pre-war position. This was before Pearl Harbor, and although little recognized in public, the Harriman-Churchill relationship indirectly drew the U.S. and Britain closer. Pamela spent more time with the elder Churchill in his bunker than with her wayward husband Randolph. She was tireless in catering to Winston's demands and always willing to eke out crucial pillow talk information. Although her marriage did not end until December 1945, she entertained lavishly from a flat at 49 Grosvenor Square, which was financed by Harriman and partly by Beaverbrook. 
Her energy and optimism drew men to her, and she often took them home. Her affair with Harriman lasted until October 1943, when Franklin Roosevelt named Harriman ambassador to the USSR, and he left London. Although she kept in touch with him throughout the war, she eased her sense of loss with other romances, notably Bill Paley, the powerful CBS American broadcaster, Jock Whitney, the husband of Betsy Cushing, and Edward R. Murrow, the charismatic self-made American broadcaster. She was calculating, independent, and opportunistic, and always managed to take care of her men. She also always managed to get something in return. Her affair with Murrow began almost immediately after Harriman left for the USSR and lasted until 1946. A smitten Murrow asked her to marry him, and she would have accepted, but guilt and his newborn son ended the romance. For a time, her American dream seemed to be over. Japan surrendered on May 8, 1945, the same year her divorce from Randolph was made final. In 1946, Harriman returned to London as ambassador and her wartime affair was renewed with the same intensity. But there was no discussion of Harriman ever leaving his wife. That September, however, Roosevelt died and the new president, Harry Truman, appointed Harriman to be Commerce Secretary and he was returned to the US. Beaverbrook, always ready to help in return for information, gave Pamela a job in New York with his Daily Express office, but this caused too much dissent. It was one thing to have a wartime romance in London with your wife back home in America, but to resume the romance in America was politically dangerous. So Beaverbrook returned her to London, where he asked her to write a column for the Evening Standard, not exactly how she wanted to be treated. London after the war just wasn't the same. It was a depressing post-war scene with Churchill out of power and a Labour Party trying hard to run a victorious but battered country. She seemed strangely out of place, 28, divorced, not attached or involved with anyone, and not meaningfully employed. The war had turned a young countrywoman into a talented social sophisticate, but now that it was over, few people in England had much sympathy for the opportunistic siren. She was lonely in London with her young son, Winston, she would certainly have gone to the U.S., where many of her lovers lived, but she now appeared abandoned. Uncomfortable with her writing assignment for the Evening Standard, she again turned to Beaverbrook. Ever ready to help and hungry for international gossip, he offered Pamela a job in Paris, reporting on the social activities of the rich shipping magnates Stavros Niarchos and Aristotle Onassis, as well as Prince Ali Khan, the son of the fabulously wealthy Aga Khan, spiritual leader of the Imami Ismaili Muslims. Ali Khan was at that time the world's most notorious playboy with a keen interest in horse racing and women. So the ever ambitious Pamela changed her focus entirely and moved to Paris, a city enjoying a more exotic revival after liberation from German occupation. Khan asked her to dinner and the intimacy began. She learned a lot from him. He was dark, extremely good-looking, and able to zone his attention on his female quarry to the exclusion of everyone else, no matter how beautiful or how important. Pamela's reputation, too, had preceded her, and she learned in their short entanglement to apply all her considerable social skills by catering to a man's needs. For a while, they were inseparable, but then Rita Hayworth entered Ali's life, and his focus shifted. So did hers. One evening, a motor launch pulled up at the foot of Ali Khan's terrace in the south of France, and she saw the chiseled head of Gianni Agnelli. Leaving her young son, Winston, behind with a friend, she accepted Agnelli's invitation to go to Monte Carlo, from where she continued on his yacht to Capri. She was in love again. Agnelli's fiat empire at that time was estimated to be worth billions. He was probably the richest man in Italy. Ignoring the fact that Fiat had made trucks for Mussolini during the war, Pamela concentrated her entire attention on pleasing him. It was said that Pamela Churchill could smell out a rich man in a crowded set of rooms blindfolded. By 1948, she had acquired a worldly wisdom. Her relationship with Agnelli was a perfect match. She had a name and had class, he was rich. Pamela loved Paris and the life Young Winston was tucked away in a Swiss boarding school while she flitted with Agnelli from Paris to Rome, St. Moritz, the south of France, London, and to Turin. Later, she said the five years following 1948 were the happiest in her life. 
She was so determined to marry Agnelli that she converted to Catholicism. She even became pregnant by him, but was forced to have an abortion in Switzerland as Agnelli did not want to give up his freedom. By the fourth year of their affair, the relationship became strained. Agnelli was incapable of fidelity and had no intention of marrying a woman with her background, even though she nursed him after a bad car crash, which almost resulted in a leg amputation. In 1953, while still in hospital, he got Morella Caracciolo di Castagneto pregnant, a girl who had had a crush on him since her teen years. And from a noble Catholic family, an abortion was impossible. So, with her three months pregnant and him still on crutches, they walked down the aisle. As a parting gift, he gave Pamela a Bentley, an apartment and a large sum of cash. Soon Pamela found a new man, Baron Elie de Rothschild one of the richest men in France. He too was taken by the bubbly character of the young English aristocrat, now in her mid-thirties, and her ease and ability to cater to all his needs, not just in his bedroom, but also in his expansive love of the arts. She improved her knowledge of furniture, art, winemaking, history, and horses during these years with Rothschild. When the Baron's wife found out about the affair, she drove her car directly into Pamela's Bentley. Both women were unharmed. She continued to see other men, the Greek ship owners Stavros Nyarkos, Aristotle Onassis, the Spanish nobleman and racing car driver Marquise de Portago, and Charles Reitman, a Texan millionaire. The Duchess of Windsor, too, gave her some useful pointers of how to live in an expensive world, clothed by Dior, Balenciaga, and Chanel, and getting others to pick up the tab. Louise de Vilmorin, too, who convened a salon south of Paris and collected both husbands and lovers fascinated Pamela. She was a fast and keen student. In 1958, Pamela was 40, and the affair with de Rothschild had lasted six years. She had had a good run in Paris, and it was time to look after her future. Her 10 years in France had been fun and profitable, and she had learned an awful lot. Pamela turned her attention to other romantic interests, including the prominent agent and producer Leland Hayward, who was married to the American socialite later known as Slim Keith. During a rocky period in his marriage, Hayward was captivated by Pamela, unaware of her scandalous history. The Churchill name enchanted him. After a few weeks, he proposed to her. Pamela sold her Paris home, moved to New York, and married Hayward in a modest civil ceremony. Together, they purchased an apartment on Fifth Avenue, directly opposite the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They hosted lavish dinner parties that attracted luminaries such as the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, Gloria Guinness, Henry and Jane Fonda, and Laurence Olivier. These events quickly caught the attention of Truman Capote, who befriended Pamela, captivated by her influence in high society. Even members of the social elite, who had previously sided with Slim, including Babe Paley, who had vowed never to speak to Pamela, were drawn to these exclusive soirees. Impressed, Babe remarked, I can see he has fallen into a tub of butter. In October 1963, leveraging her social connections and innate flair for commerce, Pamela opened a boutique specializing in antiques and reproductions. She proved to be a natural businesswoman, and the shop was a resounding success. However, when Leyland began experiencing health issues in 1967, Pamela chose to sell the business to devote herself to his care. It might have been anticipated that Leland would face health challenges. His first wife, Margaret, had committed suicide, and just a few months before meeting Pamela, his daughter, Bridget, did the same. His professional life was floundering too. Slim claimed it was due to him leaving her, but his daily drinking, nursing Jack Daniels until he slurred his words by evening, was likely a more significant factor. In March 1971, Hayward passed away after a series of strokes. After 11 years of marriage, they had depleted most of his wealth, leaving Pamela bereft at 51. The month following his death, Pamela took a break to stay with Frank Sinatra. She then embarked on a Mediterranean cruise with Gloria Guinness. In August, returning to New York and upon the encouragement of her friend Truman Capote, she reignited her relationship with Avril Harriman, whose wife had recently passed away. Six months after Leyland Hayward's death, Pamela married Harriman and moved to Georgetown, where they hosted many prominent figures. With Harriman's deep ties in the Democratic Party, 
Pamela began her political career, organizing events to support various campaigns. She was irked by Capote's references to her in his unfinished novel, Answered Prayers, where he wrote, if she had as many pricks sticking out of her as going into her, she would resemble a porcupine. In 1980, the National Women's Democratic Club honored her as Woman of the Year. After Avril Harriman's death in 1986, Pamela inherited $115 million. She continued her political activism, supporting and donating to Democratic candidates, including Bill Clinton, who appointed her as the American ambassador to France in 1993. Tragically, in 1997, while swimming in the Paris Ritz pool, Pamela suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and died the following day. The morning after her death, President Jacques Chirac of France honored Pamela by placing the Grand Cross of the Légion d'Honneur on her flag-draped coffin, making her the first female foreign diplomat to receive this distinction. In a further acknowledgement of her contributions and significance, President Bill Clinton dispatched Air Force One to return her body to the United States and spoke at her funeral at the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. He commended her public service in glowing terms. Pamela Churchill's life was a vivid saga of scandal, charm, and strategic alliances that captivated high society on both sides of the Atlantic. Known for her alluring presence and complex relationships with influential men, Pamela carved a niche for herself within the world's elite, often surrounded by controversy and intrigue. Her affairs with prominent figures, from British aristocrats to American magnates, not only made headlines, but also skillfully advanced her position in the social hierarchy. As Pamela said when reflecting on her life, I have always lived by the rule that when one door closes, another opens but you have to be alert to see it. Please let me know in the comments what your thoughts of Pamela are. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. Please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps keep the channel alive. And thanks for watching.